PJ Dixon with me right now. PJ, thank you for joining us. You're somebody that I uh, really respect and I admire. Um, I first heard PJ speak on stage at an event called Thrive. It was in Las Vegas and you were speaking in front of a thousand business owners and entrepreneurs and, yes. and people that were looking to become more successful in their life. So I am very excited for uh, this interview right now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, brother. I really appreciate it. And it's a real honor to be here for you because I actually have the utmost respect for you. There's a level of kindness and gentleness and tenderness in you that most men don't have. And for me, it creates a really well-rounded human being first of all, and a man that the world can trust. And the world really needs good men in it. And I really consider you one of the best. Well, thanks. I, re I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, for those of you who don't know PJ, you are a, a success strategist. You're a transformational coach. You're a, a speaker. You, you speak to groups. You do mentorship. You speak to corporations and do trainings. Um, but what is a little bit more of your, what is some of your background and what is the, what are the areas that you help people in? Okay. So um, if I give you just a little bit of my background, first, let's understand this. In case somebody is listening to this and not seeing me, um, I am uh, a little tiny skinny dude in a wheelchair. I'm probably like 80 pounds, um, four feet tall in my, in my wheelchair. And I have a crazy curvature in my back. So right now, as I sit here, I'm not actually in my wheelchair. Um, I'm in my studio, and so um, the crazy curvature in my spine allows my belly button to literally be on the chair between my thighs right now. So my, my butt's back there, right? Well, everybody's butt's back there, but like it sticks out because of the curvature of my spine. So think about this, like lean forward, put your belly button on the chair between, literally on the chair between your, uh, your thighs, and then arch your back and bring your shoulders upright again. So you're from lower rib cage up to the top of your head, you're upright like a normal person, right? That's what I look like. Um, and so I have a very rare form of muscular dystrophy that was expected to take my life um, at the age of seven. And fortunately, I have lived quite a bit longer than that. Um, I've been speaking since I was seven years old. And my life has literally been all about being a benefit to other people. I've been people's counselor. I've been people, and I can't say counselor because I'm not legitimately a counselor, but um, I've given people advice. I have helped them solve problems um, in all areas of their life, whether it's like, I don't know what I want to do with my career. I'm struggling with my relationship. I'm single. Um, I'm really like all these negative thoughts in my head. I'm experiencing pain. Like I want to reconnect with my, um, my, teenage son. I can't kind of, I need to figure out how to communicate better with my partners, with my friends, with my business partners, like all of that. Why? Because it all comes from the same place. It all comes from our mind. And so while I can tell you tons of stories about me and the things that happened in, in my past, it's more important for us to realize collectively that what we're going through, what we're experiencing in the world, what we're experiencing in our body is almost entirely being experienced by the mind. And I would even argue that, some might even argue that it is entirely experienced by the mind. So as we go on with our conversation, I'm gonna talk a lot about one of my favorite subjects is the conscious versus the unconscious. What's going on in the mind? How can we shift the mind so that we can remove some of the pain? And so I was literally raised by a woman, my mom, who was uh, an art therapist, a psychologist for 27 years. So I grew up reading Psychology Today, the DSM-4, um, you know, having my mom ask me questions about um, the brain and about emotions and about thinking. And so um, this is just, this is for me, this is second nature. This is the stuff that I geek out on. I get excited about what's going on in the brain and the body and how we can improve ourselves. One of the topics that we can touch on right away is uh, negative self-talk. Because a lot of people listening to this right now are in physical pain. And they're, they're dealing with sciatica. They're dealing with a, a knee, knee injury from a meniscus tear or knee arthritis. And so they are physically in pain. And me personally, I use my physical ability like to go walk, to go to the gym when we were able to go to the gym. Uh, those were ways for me to reduce stress. And I couldn't imagine, you know, if you can't even do those things, you can't even go to the gym, you can't even walk because you're in so much pain. 
how could that affect your psychology? I mean, that's going to have this, uh, you know, an incredible detrimental effect, or it has potential to. And what we need to do is we need to rewire that and reframe it. And you're probably one of the best um, individuals that I could think of to talk about this. So, and uh, the fact, you know, with your physical condition as well, you know, you're, you're confined to a wheelchair, but yet you seem like the most limitless person. So there must be something that you're doing right. So I'd love to hear what you'd have to say about negative self-talk and how we can overcome some of that negativity. So this is great. Like, I love this stuff. Okay. So um, first of all, the brain aims to, the brain aims, okay. Or sorry, the pain, the pain aims to steal your life from you. Okay. The pain aims to, to steal your life from you. So the question is, right, Buddha said, pain is inevitable, suffering is a choice. So the question is, are you going to allow the pain to steal all of your attention, steal all of your consciousness, and let you now reside only in the pain? Because if that's what happens, if you are allowing yourself to be victimized in that particular way by your brain, if your brain, your unconscious mind, the pain center inside of your brain is commandeering your consciousness then you are enslaved to that pain you are letting it choose you and think you i always say think your thoughts don't let your thoughts think you think your thoughts don't let your thoughts think you and if you are allowing the brain to to steal your consciousness away and take away what you really want to be thinking about then what happens is um, you wind up living in the pain and you lose everything else around you that you really want. And so um, if we're looking at the negative self-talk, when, when pain is so, I'm going to be quiet, or not be quiet, but I'm going to close my eyes for a minute while I talk because I want it to come through me instead of from me right now, okay? So this might seem a little weird, but I'm a little woo-woo sometimes. Um, so here's the deal. When we experience chronic pain, what happens is the brain almost starts to get cagey. It winds up being like a caged animal. It's trapped. It can't get out. It can't get away from the pain. The only thing that it wants is to get away from that pain. And so this negative stuff talk starts to happen like, I'm never going to be free again. I'm never going to be able to walk again. I tore my meniscus. My meniscus. I'm never going to be able to play sports again. I'm never going to be able to get past this pain. It's always going to um, terrorize me. It's always going to be there. I'm never going to be able to. And so if you look at these words, I'm always, I'm never, it's always, and it's never, right? These are words that are like global terms. And what happens is the unconscious mind says it so often and you experience it at the conscious level that you begin to believe it. You begin to buy into it. Okay. You're being programmed. So in the programming happens from the pain itself. And the belief comes after the program. And then the thinking, the language comes after that. So the pain occurs, okay? And then the pain stays for some of you. And when it stays, you start to believe. What do you start to believe when the pain stays? You start to believe, well, this pain is never going to leave me. Never, right? I'm always going to be in pain, always. So these are global terms. And they don't create any flexibility, any space for you to move in. Um, I teach martial arts and I train in martial arts. And I have since I was... 19 since like 87 or 88 okay and so if somebody comes up behind you and bear hugs you which means they wrap their arms around your arms and around your rib cage and they squeeze as tight as they can and you have you're stuck you can't move right your arms are locked to your rib cage you can't move forward you can't move backwards because your back is up against their chest they're pulling you against their body and you feel stuck so if this is the case you have no freedom you have no ability to move and then if you're in chronic pain, it can feel like you have no way to get out. It, feel, it can feel like you have no way to create space. It can feel like you have no choice, no option, no way, no place to turn, right? And so when somebody bear hugs you and you need to get out of that, the, one of the first things that you do is you, um, you arch your back and simultaneously lift your legs as if you're leaping down instead of leaping up. So you lift your legs so your feet so catch you. You don't put your legs straight out in front of you. You just bend your knees and your your butt drops a little bit. And as you do that, you lift up your elbows. So you arch your back, you um, lift your feet. So your butt drops a little bit, but your feet still catch you, right? So now you're bent at the knees and you're lifting your elbows simultaneously. 
Now what happens is I've just created space between their arms and my arms, between their arms and my chest, between my back and their chest, right? I've created space by pushing my head back. Now that I have the space, now I have flexibility. Now I can move. Now, okay, I feel like I can breathe again. Now that I feel like I can breathe again, now I can step out and I can wrap up their arms and I can move them away from me if I need to. So this is one of the things that we can do um, with the pain is we first of all want to change that psychology and go, okay, this freaking hurts. I'm in chronic pain. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to walk again or play sports again, but listen to my language. I went from, I'm never going to be able to, or I'm always going to be in pain to, I don't know if I'm going to. Okay. That's a huge difference. Now I've got options. I don't know if. Now I'm going to pause for a minute. I'm going to back up. Okay. A year ago, March 17th ish, I got really sick. I don't know what I had. Um, the doctor said it was some kind of virus. They didn't know what kind of virus it was. And it took 85% of my physical strength. And Mark, you've seen me on stage. So you know how skinny I am, physically skinny. You know how weak that I look. I couldn't lift my arms before, but I got so weak um, that I couldn't roll over in my bed. I truthfully didn't even know how to use my bed anymore because something happened in my mind. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to use my bed. I didn't know how to get in my bed. I couldn't roll over. I couldn't cover up because the weight of the blanket was too much for me to move. I couldn't even put a sheet on because if I rolled, if I was able to roll over, I'd get the sheet wrapped around me and then I would get stuck and then I would panic and I never had panic attacks before. So, um, and I, I successfully over the past year, I'd figured out how to control the panic attacks and anxiety attacks and I'm able to stop them before they actually come on, which is fantastic because they were terrifying when I first had them because I'd never had them before. Okay, but I've now successfully been able to catch them so soon, so early that I can shift my brain and my thinking before they attack and, and control me. So why am I telling you that? Because when I first got sick, my arms felt like they weighed 10,000 pounds and they felt like they were being ripped out of my shoulders. And it wasn't, it literally wasn't just when I slept. It wasn't when I was sitting up. It was always, it was constantly, there was nothing I could do. And I don't know why. I mean, now I know that there is some inflammation in um, my, I think my, infraspinitis. Does that sound right? Infraspinitis? Yeah, and the shoulder yeah. blade, infraspinitis. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. And so, um, but it literally felt like my arms weighed 10,000 pounds and a Wookiee was pulling them out of the sockets, right? It was terrible. Um, and so when you're in this pain, the only thing that your mind can think about is the pain and getting out of the pain and wanting out of the pain. But if you believe I can't get out, I don't know how to stop this, this is going to, uh, this is going to ruin my my life. What if it never goes away? Then all of a sudden, what, what's happening is your power is being given away, right? So what you need is you need to be able to create some space. You need to be able to give yourself an option. Your conscious mind is being stolen. Remember, pain is inevitable. Suffering is a choice. So we want to look. Okay, do I want to follow the pain, or do I want to consciously choose where I want to be? Now, this is not always easy when you're in chronic pain because the, the brain is like, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, stop it, stop it, stop it. And you can move. Some people don't want to move in chronic pain. Some people want to move constantly, right? They're just trying to escape it and get away. So there are a multitude of techniques. If you'd like, I'd love to talk about those, Mark. There's a multitude of techniques that we can utilize that will help you create distance from the pain and create the space that you need to feel like, Okay, there's an option here. Now, listen, why did I tell you that story briefly about me getting sick a year ago? Because I haven't regained my strength. My lung capacity is now about 47%, and um, I can barely push my wheelchair, but I still push it. I'm not in an, elect in an electric wheelchair because I don't want to be. I want to be independent as, as possible, um, and I can barely stop my wheelchair but I still push, I still try, I still keep going because that's important to me. So the other, I say the other day, a few months ago, I had some friends that were staying with me, um, some uh, former college roommates. And, um, and they were asking me, they're like, well, you're not upset, you're not angry, you're not hurt. And I was like, no, like I was. And this is important because when people didn't grow up with the pain and all of a sudden it's been early on or some kind of onset of the pain, from an injury or a nervous, uh, nervous system problem or whatever it is, you know, they feel like their life is ruined and changed forever. 
But here's the deal. Like if you buy into that, you're going to experience sadness, suffering, depression, anger, hurt, worry, fear. None of those feel good. I can feel all of those. I can feel angry that I can't move around the way I used to. I can feel sad. I can feel disappointed. I can feel embarrassed. I can feel frustrated. But none of those feel good. Not a single one of those feel good. So when you were talking about the negative self-talk, for me, I go, well, how do I want to feel instead? And this is one of the ways that I've warded off the anxiety and the panic attacks. The moment I start to feel them, I go, okay, hold on. Do I want to feel the anxiety and the panic? Do I want to feel the sadness, the fear, the scare, the anger, the disappointment, the frustration, the, dis the I said disappointment already, the embarrassment? Do I want to feel those? No, none of those feel good. If I don't like how I'm currently feeling, what do I want to feel instead? And that's when I'm able to shift and go, I want to feel joy. I want to feel happiness. I want to feel enthusiasm. I want to feel excited. I want to feel curious. I want to feel wonder. I want to feel um, hopeful about the future. Medicine is moving so fast right now. There's absolutely no evidence that you're going to be in pain for the rest of your life. Are you going to be in pain for another couple of days? Probably. Another couple of weeks? Maybe. Another couple of years? Maybe, maybe not. But if you know that there's an end to it, then the brain goes, oh, okay, like this is terrible, but there's an end to it. I can, I can endure for a little bit longer. Um, another quick story, if I may. Um, do, are there any questions that you have based on that? Just no, you because can go I, I get so excited. I, was gonna, I wanted to go into so we Let's talked about the negative self talk and yeah. the culmination of that, that negativity yes. combined with real physical pain that hurts can lead somebody to the point where they almost feel like their life is not worth living. I know that seems extreme. But those it's are some true. of the messages that I do get from people that are suffering with severe sciatica because in that time in their life, for those couple of weeks or that month, they're in incredible severe pain and they're willing to do almost anything to get out of pain. And yeah. how could somebody like that walk themselves back from the ledge? How could they become more optimistic or restore hope? Or how could they even just get through that really difficult time without losing their mind? Yeah, great question. Okay. so. If anybody is starting to listen to this early in their pain, let's catch it as soon as you can, which is what I do with the anxiety. The sooner you can catch it, the better. If you're deep in the throes of the pain and your brain is like drugs, suicide, like anything to get out of this pain, I'll do anything to get out of this pain, um, you're stuck. You feel like you don't have options. So one of the first things I'd like to encourage you to do is let's just take a breath, okay? Just take a breath and reclaim your presence, okay? So when I say reclaim your presence, I mean reclaim your mind, reclaim your awareness, but there's other things around you. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we can shift the brain and that brain has flexibility again, shift the brain out of the pain. So there's a number of ways that we can remove ourselves from the pain or pull away from the pain, okay? One of the ways that I like to use is, um, I describe it like this initially, and when the pain is so severe, as somebody with a sciatica, like you just explained, their brain, their conscious mind is so wrapped up in the fear. Like if they see it as a color, like for example, some of the pain that I feel in my legs sometimes feels like red, right? It just, I see it as red. It doesn't feel like red, I see it as red. And so when I'm like, oh God, that hurts. Like it's red, but the thing is like, I'm in it. I'm literally like, deep in the pain. Like I'm surrounded by it. Like I'm in the middle of um, everything around me is red. The, the floor is red, the walls are red, the, the ceiling is red, but it's not that. It's like I'm, I'm like in the middle of the pain. It's completely surrounding me and pushing up against me. I'm lost to the pain. I don't see anything outside of the pain. So we need to get out of that. And so one of the ways that I encourage, like there are a multitude of ways to pull away or push away from the pain. One of the ways is to recognize the pain and pull back from it so that you are the consciousness, you, the conscious you, it's like, okay, wait, let me observe the pain instead of be in the pain. Let me watch the pain and look at the pain instead of being captivated by um, or overwhelmed by the pain, right? Like I can experience the pain fully and completely where I'm lost to it. And the only thing that exists is the pain. Or I can pull away and go, okay, this really sucks and this really hurts, but I, but I want to pull away a little. And you can see me leaning forward like when I'm in it and pulling away from it just that little bit all of a sudden softens the, the mind, what's going on in my mind. So when I pull back from it a little bit, then what I do is if I'm seeing it in my head, 
right? I pull it out so it's actually in front of me now. So now I'm seeing the red in front of me, but not inside of my own head. So play with me if you're in the audience and you're listening. Where are you seeing your pain? Some people see it like, like, they, like if you had to visualize it and you're like, okay, this hurts, great. Where are you seeing it? I'm not seeing it, I'm feeling it. Okay, but if you were, because the brain is going to see something because it, it, it um, thinks in images, okay? And so if it's going to see the pain, does it see it inside the head? Are you lost to the pain? If you are, see what you can do to put it in front of you. And the moment you put it in front of you, you've now created a gap. And in my mind, what happens when I do that is I push it away from me. So I pull myself out of it, and then I push it away from me. And the further I can push it away, the more I create this distance. And what happens in my mind is I start to see the pain, and then I see almost like this fog around the pain, and then I see me, the conscious me, outside of that. And so on, as, the, as the pain comes through the fog and still comes to me on this side of the fog, it's not as bright red. It's not the edges aren't as sharp. Its bite isn't as, uh, as, as sharp. It doesn't have um, the same shape. Its sharp edges are softened. And so I'm talking about um, what does it look like? To you, what does it physically feel like to you? What does it, um, what does, does it have a sound like? Sometimes I have pain in my legs that I've had since I was little, 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 where it feels like two wires are crossing, two live wires are crossing, and it feels it's like it's almost like two nerves are actually touching each other, like two live wires, and it bites really quick. I'm like ah, um, and so when that happens, and it happens repeatedly, or it happens for an extended period of time. When I push it away, what happens is it doesn't feel like it's biting as much, right? I still feel it, but all of a sudden I feel like in my own mind, because we're talking about losing our minds because of this, in our own mind I feel like, okay, wait, there's a little buffer here. I still feel the pain, right? But I'm not suffering from the pain. Let's make a real clear distinction. I feel the pain, but I'm not suffering, okay? So I, I feel the pain, it hurts, but just that space, gives me this opportunity to sort of float in this ethereal place for a moment, just like, okay, wait, hold on. I don't even want to move because I feel like I found a place where like my mind has created a little bit of gap from the pain. I feel like I can breathe just for a minute. Okay. So I identifying what it looks like. Is it, what shape is it? What color is it? Or do you see it? Um, what is the texture of the pain? Is it, uh, is it, um, sharp and gritty like sandpaper? Is it sharp like barbed wire? Is it um, painful like having a rock rest on your hand? Like the weight of it is a pressure. Um, so when you're able to identify that and just observe it, all of a sudden you get lost in the observation of it. You create distance between you and it, right? And um, so look at what does it sound like? Does it have a sound? Because, oh, I know I, I, I said the uh, electrical pieces because when my legs feel like the uh, the nerves are crossing and that sort of that electric bite, not only does it feel like it's sort of biting like an electric shock, but I also can sometimes hear it go, <laughs> like it, you might hear electricity. That's not it's terrible electricity sound. Um, but it sounds in my brain a little bit like, um, like live wires touching in my head. Um, and so I've got sound that I can change. I've got the color that I see it. I've got the shape of it, the texture of it, the physical feeling of it. And so sometimes I'll push it away. There's a multitude of ways that I can do this. I'll push it away. I'll turn it upside down. I'll observe it from a different perspective. I'll go from first person where I'm in my, my brain to third person where I'm like looking at myself. I'm going, okay, I can see myself experiencing that pain. I can see the suffering on me. But wait a minute, I'm not feeling the suffering anymore. Like, I know that my body's in pain. I can sort of feel the pain, but there's a space that I've given my mind. Like, I'm looking at myself right now, outside of myself, and I see myself sitting here. I feel the pain in my ankles and my heels right now, but I'm not feeling the pain in the same way. It's just a slight buffer. It's a little less, but it's just enough that you can breathe for a few minutes. And this takes some effort. And the effort it takes is reclaiming your mind, getting your mind back, because the pain hurts so bad sometimes that it steals your conscious thinking. You get to choose um, to have your brain back. You get to choose to get your thinking back. 
the moment you start to get uh, choose to get thinking back, you'll start to get freedom from some of this pain because um, you won't have lost your brain, your mind to the pain. You won't have fallen into the pain and fallen into the epicenter of the pain and let your whole world become the pain. So when I say pull yourself away from it, push it away from you, um, there's all kinds of other like techniques that I have for dealing with the pain. And they work great as long as you are ready to say, no, I need some space. I need just some breathing room. And you're not thinking that it's gonna go away completely, but you're like, I just need a buffer. If I can get a buffer, I can get a breath. If I can get a breath, then I can make a choice. If I can make a choice, then I've got some freedom. Right now in reaction mode, reaction is a slave action. You don't have any freedom. That's why your brain, that's why you're losing your brain. That's why you're losing your mind. That's why you're thinking, I'll do anything to get out of this pain. Drugs, alcohol, please don't think suicide, but a lot of people think suicide because they're like, this, my life is over. I can't deal with this pain, it's crazy. Um, but you can. No, let me rephrase it. You can't deal with that pain, but if you pull yourself away, you can deal with the pain. Does that make sense? I really like. I'm. I really want like everything in me wants to go into like these different ways that we can deal with the pain, um, but I'm trying to like give you a taste of it without like spending all the time doing all of the talking. Yeah, as you're as you're talking, I I was thinking of uh, a toothache that I had. Okay. It was a it was a, a couple months ago. It was actually at the start of all all the stay at home orders, and so I wanted to go to the dentist, and I just wanted to wait, and I still need to go, but. Uh, to get it looked at, but it, it really started to make me very anxious. And I started thinking like, this is going to get worse. I've heard of trigeminal neuralgia. I mean, I'm just like, I don't want to have this, this toothache anymore. And uh, you, you can get really anxious and wrapped up around those thoughts. So as you're describing this, this imagery technique, I started to think about the pain in my mouth being like a ball of tinfoil. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I was chewing. It's like, I was chewing on this ball of tinfoil that was yes. jagged and it yes. had that nasty those electrical sh you know shooting <sighs> the nasty metallic flavor in your mouth yes. and then as you're just as you're talking uh, more and guiding me through that exercise then it started to transform and it started to get softer yes and it's the the edges started to get really yes. smooth so i started to think of like a crystal ball yes. and then it got even softer and then it, yeah. the, the edges started to melt and then yeah. it became a marshmallow. Yes. And then I was like sitting there like chomping on a marshmallow. And I was like, yeah. oh, this feels, this texture feels great. And it's soft yeah. and it cushions it. And so that was, it's really powerful to go yeah. through a mental activity and exercise like you just gave us as an example. So let me ask you, did the pain subside during that process? It did, absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's happened in the past too. It, it's so even right now, there's still like a faint pain yeah. that I, that I have. And yeah. when I get my mind distracted from it, then the pain is no longer there. And that's happened in the past as well. Uh, but then yeah. if I focus attention to it, then there's an increase in pain because I'm more aware of it. Then I start to get the, the negative thoughts about, Oh yes. my gosh, I'm going to have to get a root canal. They might have to just extract the whole tooth. I wonder if the teeth next to it are decayed as well. And they're going to have to take those out. Yes. So then I just start to get into this, these thoughts. And so you described about a little bit of between the, the conscious and the subconscious. So how do those two domains of our cognition play a role here? What is it, you know, what is the subconscious? What is the conscious? And what is the common mistake that people are, that might be making, um, you know, not, not like it's their fault, but yeah. what is the, what is the condition that so many of us experience? When so Mark, this is it. such great. This is so great. Okay. So first of all, I make a clear distinction between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. The subconscious mind I see as the bridge between the two. Okay. So let me explain what I mean a little bit more clearly. The conscious mind is what we're consciously thinking about observing that tastes good. That smells good. She's beautiful. He's attractive, right? I, uh, this is a really interesting book. That's a funny movie. We're very aware of these kinds of things on a conscious level. Like I'm looking around, I can see the colors in my house. I'm aware of our conversation. The unconscious is when I said, think your thoughts, don't let your thoughts think you. When all of a sudden something pops up in your head and you're like, why did I think that? Like, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but a lot of people that I've talked to, they're driving along, you know, and they drive over a bridge 
And at some point in their driving career, they thought, I wonder what it would be like if I turned the wheel and drove over the bridge and, you know, into the water. Like, they don't want to kill themselves. They're not sad. They're not depressed. Their brain just goes, oh, let me think about that because I need to know as the unconscious mind, specifically the, um, the, what we commonly know as the fight or flight area of the brain, what I refer to as the protection protocol, it goes, I want to go out here and explore what would happen if I drove over the edge of the bridge because I need to know whether or not we can survive that. If we can't survive that, then I need to make sure, I being the fight or flight principle or process, I need to make sure that I am encouraging you not to do that, right? Okay, so I make a very clear distinction between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. And the subconscious mind, which is what you said, for me, resides right in the middle. So let me make the clear distinction. The conscious mind is the mind that you consciously choose to think thoughts about. Like, not just thoughts that randomly pop up in your head, but things that you actually are like, hmm, I wonder what will happen if I do this, huh? I'm thinking, like, maybe I should add a little more salt to this recipe. Um, wow, like, I love this painting that I'm doing, but I feel like it needs a little bit more red in it. Oh, yeah, that's much better. Okay, I like how that's turning out. This is the conscious mind. The unconscious mind is the mind that does like 85 plus percent of the thinking for you, which means when I said earlier, think your thoughts, don't let your thoughts think you. What I'm talking about is when you consciously think your thoughts, the emotions follow your thinking. And so if you will find yourself in an, in an, in an emotional state that doesn't feel good to you, that is probably because your unconscious mind is thinking you. It's thinking thoughts of pain and suffering and struggle. And um, it's not, you are not consciously taking over. So even though I might physically be in pain on occasion, not always, and sometimes it's extended pain, right? Even though I might physically be weak, even though I might get frustrated because I can't roll over in my bed or I, you know, like I used to, um, I can still choose in that moment to say, this is the conscious mind. The conscious mind can still choose to say, you know what? I don't like how I'm feeling. So what would I rather feel instead? I don't like feeling frustrated. So what would I rather feel instead? I'd rather feel hopeful. I'd rather feel great, grateful. I'd rather feel um, excited about the possibilities of the direction that we're going. I'd like to, I'd rather feel um, optimistic, not positive thinking, but optimistic that medicine and science are moving fast enough that at some point in the future, I'm going to regain the strength or I'm, it's pain is going to subside from me. Um, and so this is a conscious opportunity. The unconscious is what creates the fear and the anxiety and the worry. The unconscious is when it's almost like it sneaks up on you. It's when you go, oh, wow, that's a weird thought that just happened in my head. For example, I'm driving across a bridge and my mind goes, oh, I wonder what it would be like to uh, drive over the edge of the bridge. I don't want to, I consciously don't want to drive over the bridge, but the unconscious mind wants to explore that. So the fight or flight process, the part of the brain that I call the protection protocol goes, hey, let me check that out. Oh, drive over the bridge, fall through the air, crash into the water, probably dangerous, probably not safe. Okay, cool. Don't do that. So now it, it has a condition. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, it, um, you walk up to the edge and part of you feels like you're being sucked in and pulled in to the Grand Canyon. It's a f fascinating phenomenon. And then part of your brain might go, huh, I wonder what would happen if I jump in. And then all of a sudden you're terrified and you're like, ah, that is a terrible thought. And you step back. Why? Because all of a sudden you're scared. The unconscious brain goes, okay, cool. I haven't thought about that before. Definitely don't want to do that. Cool. I'll remember that. So if you get too close to an edge, I'll remind you that it could potentially, potentially be dangerous. So the unconscious mind is designed to protect you. When the physical body is in so much pain, that's why it constantly is like bombarding and taking over your conscious mind. It's constantly putting your conscious mind in the pain because it's trying to say, hey, something's not right and you hurt so bad right now that I want you to remove yourself from this pain. It wants you to be, wants you, the conscious you, to be aware of the pain. And you're like, I am very much aware of the pain. Stop putting me in the pain. This is not helpful, right? But it thinks that because the body's in pain, it's trying to say, hey, I don't know what you're doing out there, uh, but it's hurting on the inside. So we need to like stop doing what you're doing. And so the conscious mind gets wrapped up in that pain. But if instead you realize that the conscious mind 
is getting sucked in by the pain and you go, okay, hold on. That's not what I want. I need to be skillful in my thinking. Buddhists would say being skillful in your thinking. That means I need to consciously choose what I want to think about instead of being thought by the, by the unconscious mind. Now the subconscious mind, just briefly, um, I consider a bridge between the conscious and the unconscious. So if I'm in my conscious mind and I go, there's something like, I can feel it. There's something like, it's just something feels off. Something's not right. Something seems weird. Something's uncomfortable. It's on the tip of my tongue. This is the subconscious. It's almost like when we're saying that, it's almost like we have our fingers on the pulse of our unconscious mind. We don't know what the unconscious mind is doing yet, but the subconscious mind is sort of percolating. It's sort of bubbling up. It's sort of like it's, it's doing some kind of movement. There's some kind of vibration there that the more we slow down, the quieter we get, the more we start to hear, oh, this is what it's saying. Oh, that's what that means. Oh, that's why I'm upset. Okay, so the subconscious mind for me is a bridge between the unconscious and the conscious. And the more we listen to it, the more it opens up for us to understand what's going on in the unconscious. Now, listen, let's, be, let's just be practical and physical. The unconscious mind in this one particular case with pain, specifically emotional pain or, psych or uh, physical pain, is saying, this hurts. You need to remove yourself from the pain. If you're not in physical pain, but you are having emotional pain, and um, you know, you're sad from a breakup, a loss, or whatever, right? or you're feeling guilty, this works really well with guilt, you're feeling guilty, the reason that the brain is going over and over and over and over it again is because what happened hurts. And so you're feeling guilty because the brain goes, hey, I don't want you to experience that again. So I'm going to make you feel guilty. And I'm going to let you feel guilty for the rest of your life if I have to, as long as I can keep you from that experience. And what you can do is skillfully, I'm going to use that word again intentionally, is skillfully look at your, your situation that you were in, find out what um, caused guilt. What did I do that makes me feel guilty? Oh, I did this and I wish I'd done this instead. When you create a new plan, skillful thinking, when you create a new plan, I'm being very brief about this because we, this is not directly relevant, but it's relevant enough. When I say, okay, let me create a new plan. And then I identify the trigger point of when I'm gonna run the new plan. So I don't find myself in that, that unfortunate situation again. But instead of go, oh, okay, hold on, here's the trigger. This is what I did last time and it caused me to feel guilt, right? And emotional pain. So here's what it is, my new plan. I'm gonna run my new plan. Cool, so as long as I know what the trigger is, I know what the new plan is because I wanna avoid the old pain and I commit to that, the guilt will immediately go away. Now, what about physical pain? Very, very similar, okay? In that, we wanna use our brain skillfully. So. Remember a moment ago when you were talking about chewing on that tinfoil ball and feeling it poking and stabbing and that metallic feeling, and you said that it, it then turned into a crystal ball and then it softened and turned into a marshmallow, and right? And all of a sudden, everything was like softer and the pain. I asked you, I said, um, a moment ago, we had a, a bit of a, a break, you and I. I said, did the pain, I asked you, did the pain go away? And you're like, yeah, the pain went away a little bit because I put my brain over here but if we put our brain in to the pain, all of a sudden we're consumed by the pain again. Yes, this is skillful use of your brain. This is skillful use of your mind. So when you realize that you're in pain, and I do this, I literally, I have so many different, I, I'm not in chronic pain, but I'm in pain every day, different times of the day. So when people go, are you in pain? I will almost always say, not really, because I'm not in chronic pain. Like right now, my hips hurt because I'm in a static state and I can't move. But I can focus on that and I can be like, oh, it starts to squirm around. Or I can just say, no, that's not that. Yes, I feel that. But where do I want to be? I want, I want my conscious mind to be in my heart. I want my conscious mind to be connected to my brain, right? And so I want my consciousness in my heart, in my brain, and expanding outward into the camera so that I know that what I'm doing is I'm conveying information. So my attention is not on the pain. Yeah, I feel it in the background, right? But it's a little like you can hear the kids playing in the bedroom, but you're not paying attention to what they're saying. You just know that they're saying something and playing and having a good time. Or you hear the TV on in another room, but you're not really aware of what's, what's being played. You're just like, oh yeah, I hear the noise. 
okay? And so it's the same when you choose skillfully to place your mind in a different place. So when I was talking about um, what, does, what does the pain look like in your mind? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? When you start to do that and you start to go, okay, these are the three categories, see, feel, and hear. If I start to change those qualities, then I start to change the pain. So sometimes I'll pull out of the pain, right? Sometimes I'll push the pain away. Sometimes I'll go into third person. Sometimes um, there's another one that I wanted to share with you. Give me a sec. Oh, this, this is a really cool one that I just came up with recently and I love it. So if you take the pain that you're feeling, wherever it is, like if you're experiencing sciatica, like, um, like Mark suggested earlier, right? If you've got that pain, move the pain. See if you can feel it in a different part of your body. And when you move it, like, even if you're like, well, you mean like sciatica in my right side and I want to put it on my left side? Sure. Or take that sciatica and put it in your, uh, the space between your elbow and your, and your shoulder. Can you feel it in that space? Right? Right between the tricep and the bicep on the inside of your arm. Can you feel it there? You're probably going to be like, not really. I mean, I can sort of like kind of make up the pain. But as you're doing that, are you feeling the sciatica pain in the same way? I guarantee the answer if you're skillfully using your mind is no, I'm not feeling the pain in the same way. Because what the mind is trying to do is it's trying to find and or create pain in a place that doesn't have pain. And if you're really being skillful, you're trying to create the same kind of pain in an area of your body that doesn't hurt. Now, some of you might be like, ah, oh, what if I do that? If I do that, then aren't I like, gonna, like aren't I gonna turn into it? I'm, aren't I gonna like start that kind of pain in a different part of my body? No. You're not. And while the mind is powerful, we're not planning on doing that forever. We're just trying to give you a little bit of a break, right? So when the pain comes on in a really intense level, can we move it? Can we shift it? Can we change its color? Can we change its texture? Can we change, put it behind you? So remember when I said move it in front of you? Now take the pain, see it, the color, the shape, all of that, make it smaller. Squ squish it up in your brain. like. Like reach out with your physical hands and wad it up like a, like a ball. Turn it inside out, right? Um, throw it over your shoulder. Roll it between your legs behind you. Throw it behind you. Go to the bathroom and put it in the toilet. Throw it down in the toilet. Flush the toilet. Wash your hands. Wash your face. Walk away. What happens is the moment you tell, you tell the brain that it's different, it's a different color, it's a different texture, it's a different form, it's a different shape, it's in a different location, it's behind me and not in front of me, it's not inside of my brain, the moment you start to change these things is the moment the pain will start to subside and shift and change. There's another one where you pull the pain out. They're actually using this in hospitals and it works phenomenal. You literally, like as if, like let's say the pain in your tooth mark um, was something you wanted to pull out. So physically, you reach up with both hands and you start to try to pull it out and, and maybe you see it as red yarn. Right, but you said you see it as a tinfoil ball. So as you're pulling it out, you're pulling out the tinfoil ball, right? And go back to make sure there aren't any little sharp edges left in there, anything that needs to be healed, like did your gums get cut or anything? So when you do that, you pull the tinfoil ball out. What if you uh, flatten the tinfoil ball? What if you rolled it up? What if you folded it over? What if you turned it into cloth? What if you turned it into um, cotton candy? What if you turned the cotton candy inside out and it became clouds and what if you now put that in it went from this silver black color to this white color and now you push it back into that space literally and you spin it in a different way it was moving in a particular way before and what if it's now spinning completely the opposite and what if it's spinning slowly instead of sharply or fast quickly now what happens the pain changes they're using that that technique in emergency rooms before they're giving people um pain uh, medication. Fascinating. Yeah, it's very fascinating how you have this, this physical representation of the pain, because we know that there is a, uh, a representation of each body part in yes. the brain. I recently gave my mom for Mother's Day a coloring book, it, but it was yes. one of those apps. It's, it's like yes. those, uh, those apps where you can color. And so remember those as a kid, you know, right, you had different numbers the yeah. color one two yes. three and, yes. and you had to do uh, you know you're just filling out a coloring book well there's certain parts of the body like the fingertips the hands the feet the tongue the eyes the face 
those have those are sensitive areas. That's why it hurts so much when you uh, get a paper cut or you stub your toe in the door or you know you shut the door the car door on your on your hand or your finger. It hurts a lot because those areas in the body have a strong representation and they are mapped on the brain. And so for us to make that physical connection uh, with the pain, you know, it's, it, it can do, it can be very powerful for alleviating pain. Um, you, you touched on the, the, second, the conscious and the subconscious, and that was amazing. Now for somebody who is dealing with a lot of subconscious thoughts, like if you've had pain for a while, it's, it could be really hard to, to implement some of this. And so um, what are some of the steps to rewiring the brain and to relearning all of this? Because I'm sure there's a lot more to it than just what you're describing. Sure. So, you know, the very first thing is let's just get your brain back. Okay. So can you, in this moment, you've had pain for a long time and you seem to be stuck in the pain. One of the ways to rewire the brain is what do you consciously want to see or think about instead? Okay. So right now let's make it really super simple. Look for anything in, the, in your room where you're sitting, anything. Look away from the screen right now. Look at anything you want. I, I, you can even look at the screen. Look at my face. Look at Mark's face. It doesn't matter to me. Look at something and study it. What is the shape of it? Can you see the lines? Now can you see the color? Now look at the color. Are there, is it one solid color? Or can you see based on the way the shadow hits it and the way it moves or the way it turns or curves? the way the light hits it, does it change the color? So if it is like, I'm looking at a book that's like sort of this rust color in front of me, right? So is it all completely that color or is there subtle changes to it? Can you see how the light's hitting it? Where is the shadow? What's the shape of the shadow? What's the direction of it? So when you consciously choose to place your mind somewhere else, what you're doing is you're strengthening your mind. So if we look at the unconscious mind, and the conscious mind, the unconscious mind, if it controls 85 plus percent of your psychology, it's working out 85% of the time. Whereas your conscious mind might be working out at best 15% of the time. Which means that your unconscious mind is much stronger than your conscious mind. So you have to be skillful with your conscious mind. Consciously choose what do I want to see, feel, hear, taste, or touch and be aware of while I'm doing it instead of the pain. Right now, what am I seeing? What is the shape of it? What is the color? How does the light hit it? How does the, um, the shadow, what is the shape of the shadow? What is the color of the shadow? If I was going to paint it, what colors would I choose? What colors would I mix? What does this feel like? What does the couch feel like that I'm sitting on? What does the chair feel like? Where am I feeling it on my, on my leg? Where am I feeling it on my arm? If I move my arm just slightly, can I feel the texture? Do I need to feel it differently with my fingertips? If I move here and feel it with my fingertips, well, how does that feel differently? You can hear that I'm even speaking softer. Why? Because what I'm suggesting is that we soften everything by just focusing on one thing. And meditation, the reason that meditation works with pain, psychological as well as physiological pain, is because the human brain, believe it or not, really focuses on one thing at a time. Now, if you have a lot of mental chatter, you might be like, dude, you don't know what my brain does. Wrong. My brain focuses on stuff all the time. It's constantly going, right? But what's happening is in that second, that millisecond, it's focused on the one thing. And then maybe that one thing gets interrupted. And now there's another thought that's going through. And now another gets interrupted. And now you've got another thought and then it gets interrupted and another thought. But in that millisecond, it's only focused on one thing. When I am flying, you know, if I'm flying to um, do a presentation somewhere in the world, um, then occasionally I'll sit next to somebody who's afraid to fly. And the thing is that they're not afraid to fly. They're afraid of falling out of the air. They're afraid of crashing. So in that moment, even when we're on the tarmac, we're not even in the air. Where is their brain? In the fear. Their brain has been commandeered, captured by the fear that the unconscious mind is thinking about in the future. So we bring it back to the present moment. That's why we bring it back to what am I seeing right now? What am I smelling right now? What am I tasting right now? You know, um, 
uh, so many people are into essential oils right now, right? And so many people say, oh, they're great for, you know, tranquility and calming you down and stress relief. And maybe they are, but one of the best things that they're great at is they just change your consciousness in that moment because we don't smell a lot of things, right? We smell the food when it's cooking. Sometimes you smell gas at the, you know, when we're uh, filling up gas. Sometimes you smell somebody's body odor. Sometimes on occasion, if we're lucky in the spring, we smell the waft of the flower on the, on the wind current. Mm, it just smells amazing. And what it does is it just takes us away. It steals us away from anything that we might be experiencing or seeing in that moment, right? Because it allows us to become present. It allows us to come back to something different. It shifts our consciousness. And this is what I'm suggesting is the very first step. Again, hear me getting softer. Is because the very first step is just one tiny thing. Where can you place your mind on something that tastes, feels, smells? What, do you, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What's, where can you place your mind? Which of those five senses can you use? in that moment to shift your mind? And then can you do two senses at one time? And then can you do three senses? And what happens is when you start to do that, you have to like, you physically have to relax your body because what happens is you need to create an openness in your mind to bring in more information simultaneously. And so for me to be able to hear and see at the exact same time, not like shift back and forth, but to be able to bring in like, okay, I'm really looking at the color and the shape of my camera right now. And I'm also very aware of what the, uh, the chair feels like under my left arm, right? And I'm very aware of how my lip feels, my bottom lip. Why am I doing that? Because what I'm doing, and you can sort of see me staring off into space, what I'm doing is I'm opening up my consciousness to drink in as much information as I possibly can. But start with one thing. Start with one thing and then expand and play with it. You know, like you said, you, um, you did that sort of color by numbers thing with your mom. Sure, where's your tongue right now? Where's your nose right now? Where's the left side of your nose? Can you, you know, can you feel your left ear lobe? Can you feel your right ear lobe, right? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I feel it. Is the pain there at the same time? Well, I mean, no, but I mean, the pain's constantly there. But when you shift and just think about your left ear lobe or your right ear lobe, right? Or your right eyebrow or your left eyebrow. The moment you do that, all of a sudden your mind shifts just momentarily. It gives you just enough of a break from the pain to realize, this is important, it gives you just enough time to realize, hold on, I can control my brain. Hold on, I can shift away from the pain. Hold on, I do have the ability to get my brain back. And that's all you need. You just need a little hope to know that you can take the next step. When you were explaining that and you were talking about flying and yeah. yes. sitting next to somebody that has a fear of flying, mm -hmm. it made me think of all the phobias that people have. Yeah. And when it comes to movement, the fear of moving is called kinesiophobia. Yeah. So you could be afraid of doing a movement that hurt you previously. Yes. If you lifted something wrong, mm -hmm and you get a back surgery and now you're going to go lift the same item again or do the same activity that resulted in your injury or if you went for a run or a walk mm -hmm. or you tried a new exercise and that gave you foot pain and you developed mm -hmm. plantar fasciitis mm -hmm. it's going to be really tough to get back into doing some of those similar activities and mm -hmm. it might cause somebody to avoid them altogether and to be limited. But what you're saying is to focus on something very simple and taking an action step and giving yourself hope that you can, you can get better with that specific movement or activity or belief that you had. Yes. So let me say this. Let me add to that. Um, so let's think about this. I'm going to lift something that hurt my back before. Okay. So same, it's a, the exact same principle. One tiny step at a time. Okay, so let me, let me walk up to it. And as I'm walking up to it, let me be aware. I'm not gonna squat yet. I'm not gonna reach down to pick it up. I'm just gonna, I'm going to walk up. Now let me be aware of my body. 
Where's my body in space? How are my feet standing? Do I feel solid? How, like, how close is that to me? How close am I to it? Where's my back? Am I aligned? How's my breathing? What's going on with my psychology? Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to squat. Okay. All right. Let me stand back up. Okay. All right. The nervousness starts to come, right? The fear. Okay. But what if I pick it up and I get hurt? Calm down. You haven't, you're not there yet. You haven't gotten hurt yet. You haven't even touched the box, for example, yet. So, right. Calm down. Okay. All I was doing was squatting. Okay. Squatting down again. So squat down again. Can I, can I get to the point where I'm squatting without fear? Okay. Stand back up. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay, I, I'm not. I'm not afraid. Okay, cool. Just touch the box. Okay, cool. Now let go of the box and stand back up. Okay, cool. Whew. Okay, yeah, I can do this. This is crazy. It's ridiculous. Like it's just a box. Why am I so afraid? Don't worry about it. Your brain is afraid. Okay, so the con the unconscious is afraid, but the conscious brain is buying into the story. So what I'm teaching you to do is not buy into the story. So many times we hear people nowadays say, oh, that's just your story. Oh, that's just their story. No, it's not their story. It's the unconscious mind's story that the conscious mind, in many cases, is beginning to buy into. So what if we do this? Okay, double check my stance again. Okay, I feel pretty good. My back is straight. But let me squat again. Let me touch the box. Okay, yeah, okay, no problem. Just let go of the box, stand up again. Let's do it again. Okay, I feel good. Check my stance. Okay, squat again. Reach down, touch the box. This time, the plan is to actually just like pull on the box to feel the weight of it. Not lift it, just let me just get an idea of the weight. Okay, I got, I reach down, I squat, I feel strong, I touch the box, I start to lift it a little, I feel the tension in my forearms, I feel the tension in my fingers holding on, I feel my legs starting to, to need to strengthen just a little to stabilize myself, I can feel the strength in my back. Okay, great, I feel the weight, I set it down, right? I, don't, I didn't even lift it, but I felt the weight by lifting so I could feel the tension, let go, stand up. This seems ridiculous, but do you want to protect yourself? Yeah. Do you want to get hurt again? No. So if you want to overcome the psychology, go little, little step by little step by little step by little step. Don't feel like you have to go over and do it all right now. That, especially if you're a man, that's just male ego that's going to get you hurt. That's dumb. Take care of you. Take care of you. Be safe. In that way, if you go little step by little step, you go, okay, cool. Like I can lift this. Don't lift and twist lift, stand up, take a breath, and then go, okay, where are we? Notice I'm saying we. Okay, where are we moving? We meaning conscious mind, subconscious mind, unconscious mind, body, legs, arms, right? Okay, where are we moving next? Take this step, okay, this step. Be very aware, very conscious of all of your movements. And then be very conscious of setting something down. Don't just, don't just let it go real quick. Because if you let it go real quick, what are you doing? You're letting go of control. And that means that you could get hurt. You're letting go of awareness. So instead, set it down slowly and intentionally. Once you know it's stable, release your hold, stand back up, step away, and then think, oh, okay, I did that. That felt good. Really, that, that was good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, wow, well, okay, I did that. Okay, that feels good. So what we're doing is we're now priming and anchoring in brain a good feeling that we are successful, that we can still do that. We just might want to be a little bit safer. So there are times when I might twist and all of a sudden my neck gets, like, uh, gets kinked. And I go, oh, okay, if I move any further or I can feel a rib popping out because of the curvature of my spine. And I go, oh, okay, I can feel a rib coming out or my neck is kinked. Stop for a sec. Now, I'll literally stop. And I go, okay, what's the order that I, that I just went in? Let me go in reverse order. So I go, okay, reverse order, unkink. Okay, whew, all right, good. Let me check, the rib's not out, okay. Neck feels okay, all right, let me move again. All right, cool, I just move slightly different and all of a sudden I'm okay, but I catch it because I go little bit by little bit by little bit if I have to. The more consciously aware you are of what's going on in your body, the more you have choice. But if you're not consciously aware, if the only thing you're aware of is the pain, then you don't have choice, you don't have freedom. You want to be aware of the fullness of your experience as a human. What are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are you hearing? What are the different parts of my body that aren't hurting doing? Am I grateful for those? Or am I only resistant? Instead of being resistant, why not be inclusive? What are the other parts of my body feeling? Like I might feel the pain in my hips right now, but my shoulders feel really good. My arms feel really open and relaxed. My face feels ten without tension. 
right? There's joy in my face. There's joy in my heart. There's tension in my hips. I feel it. Sure, I'd like to shift. I'd like to adjust. But I can also live with it because that's not where I'm living. I can live with it because that's not where I'm living consciously. I'm living in my heart right now instead. I'm living in my shoulders, my arms, my face. I'm living in the emotional sensation that I'm having instead. So I can live with the pain in my hips for a while if I need to because it's lessened. But the moment I put my mind my, my, in my hips, I want tension release. I want to get it away from it as quickly as I can. But what if instead I just look at it and I explore it and I go, well, what shape is it? Where is it? Is it in both hips? How far down my leg does it go? Does it go into my knees? Does it go into my feet? Does it go up into my back? The moment I start to explore it, I'm no longer feeling it. I'm observing it. I'm no longer experiencing it. I'm feeling it, but I'm no longer experiencing it as the only thing. I'm observing it as an outside observer. I'm looking at it as an explorer, I'm getting curious. Is it sharp edges or the pain? Does it like sort of get to a point and just sort of dissipates like a cloud? Or is it like, no, it's, it really hurts here and in the very next section, it doesn't hurt at all. How does it feel? Is it sharp? Is it cutting? Is it biting? Is it achy? You know, the more you explore, the less pain. Because you're, you, the conscious you, is separating out away from the pain. You are looking at it as almost like a third person, right? From the third person view. You're no longer in it. You're now outside observing and looking at it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense a lot. And you're bringing an awareness to it. And I love how you used the word earlier uh, and you repeated the, the use of the word skillful. Yes, sir. And because you're talking about having a skillful mind, uh -huh. and that's one of my central messages about movement and about exercise. And okay. what I do as a physical therapist with people in the clinic is skillful movement. If somebody has a fear of pain because of this kinesiophobia or yes. this lower back injury or this pain that they're experiencing, they need to learn how to go through movements yes. in a pain-free manner or with less pain and realize that they're not as threatening as they once were. So we're really doing similar things. You're, you, you're focusing, you have more of an emphasis on the mind and mm -hmm. I have more of an emphasis on the physics of how we're using leverage and torque mm -hmm. and gravity and our load and mm -hmm. our body mechanics mm -hmm. to create movement. But essentially we're doing the same thing. We're doing something well, very similar. They come from the same place, right? They come from the brain, right? The, the, the difference is, are they going to come from the unconscious brain or are they going to come from the conscious brain? What you're doing is exactly to me the same thing that we're doing. You're just saying, hey, consciously, I want you to think about what you're doing with your body. I'm saying the same thing. Instead of just going over and picking it up, ah, oh, I hurt my back. Yeah, you hurt your back. You weren't paying attention. You were living from the unconscious mind. Your mind wasn't here present with you. And I think we're doing the exact same thing. Yeah. And, and those learned behaviors that somebody has picked up through the years, those unconscious movements that we do, they they're driving the system. And so to, to get out of pain and to move better, to get past this injury, you need to rewire the brain and you need to reprogram your movements because you're really becoming more conscious of how your body is moving through space and you're able to do more activities that way. So in, in a 30 minute session, we can often spend the entire time teaching somebody how to do a movement that's very simple. And so it, it can be, sometimes it can seem tedious, it can seem like it's taking a while, and the perception from an outsider looking in could be that you're not even doing that much. People want to exercise, they want to do a workout program, they want to sweat, but there's big differences in your training methodology. You could be doing exercises to, to increase your heart rate, to improve your cardiovascular endurance. You could be doing exercises for strength training because you want to lift more weight and you want to build muscle. There's even differences with that, even within strength training. You can work on different muscle fiber types. If you want to build muscle and grow muscle and get hypertrophy, then there's specific training for that. And so if you're trying to work on chronic pain, then there's specific training methodologies for that as well. And we need to be aware of those things. So, And, and you're teaching them slow movement, like from the outside. People might be like, wow, what are you doing? Like, but you're teaching them to be aware through that little movement. And I'm teaching the same thing. Be aware of where your mind is in the little movement, right? Just take a, a small movement, take a small step, shift your weight physically in just a little bit, shift from your thinking or from your visual to your audio, 
or you know what you're seeing to what you're hearing shift from from what you're hearing to what you're physically feeling these are small movements that teach you how to move your body or how to move your mind it's skillful it's intentional it's conscious and it's play it doesn't have to be work it doesn't have to be difficult why not let it be playful the simple there's something uh, called the feldenkrais um uh, methodology, which you probably are aware of, it's a method of movement and it's a way of playing with the body to see how the body moves. In therapy, physical therapy, it can be the same. It can be play. With the mind, it can be the same thing. It can be play. Like, I'm curious, like, if I look out the back, what's the shape of that tree? What's the color of it? What's the texture of the bark? How fast are the leaves moving in the wind? Are all the leaves moving in the same direction? No. Why are some going that way and some going that way? Oh, maybe the wind is spinning in a different way that becomes fascinating lose yourself in other areas of your body instead of lose yourself in other areas of your mind lose yourself in other areas of your world instead of losing yourself to the pain don't let it win think your thoughts don't let your thoughts think you right you can feel the pain but you don't have to buy into it you don't have to suffer you can feel the pain but you don't have to suffer because of the pain. You don't have to. You can, but you don't have to. I know both of us could go on and on and on on chronic pain and discussing this topic, but if somebody wants to get in touch with you, if they want to learn more information about how to be skillful with their mind, how could they get in touch with you and learn more about that? So you can either go to pjswisdom.com and um, look for an area, I think, that says contact me um, or contact us. Or you can simply, I'll make sure, Mark, that you have a link that they can just sign up for a one-on-one -on -one call with me. Okay? So it's like calendly.com slash pjloveguru slash true love or something. I don't know what it is. So I'll send you a link because it's, a link that I've used uh, for the past five years. I just haven't changed the uh, what it was called. So I'll make sure that you have an access to that link. So anybody can just click in the email and or at the bottom of this video and um, they'll have access to, you know, just jumping on a few minute call with me if they want. We'll see what we can do to support you. Does that sound okay? That sounds wonderful. Yeah. At the end of the interviews, I always like to be able to offer everyone an opportunity to get a to get a free gift with you so um yeah, that sounds like a good a good way to get in touch and maybe chat with you for a couple minutes you know I, I could give a free you know video or i could give a free like pdf book right and that's all wonderful and great or we could get on a call and just be like okay tell me what your pain is let's play with it let's see if we can shift you uh, your consciousness and help you find some relief in you know, a 20 minute call. We can do a lot in 20 minutes. If you're willing to give me a call and say, here's my pain, here's what I'm going through, let's see what we can do. You know, Let's see what we can do. We can try a number of techniques and if we, find, if we can find something that gives you even just a little bit of respite, just a little bit of movement, just a little bit of breath, just a little bit of relief, wouldn't that alone be worth it? But what if we find something that just in just a few minutes where you go, wow, that was amazing, like, like, I still feel the pain, but I'm not suffering from it. Okay, cool. Or why well, I don't feel the pain at all anymore. That's even better. We never know. But, you know, when we talk, we'll know better that way. Well, I, I appreciate your time, your knowledge, the exercises that you took us through. And hopefully we can jump on a call again and do another training in the future. Because I know, I know people are getting helped by this. I know people are are getting to understand that they have more control and power and resources and strategies and specific methods to deal with chronic pain or deal with this injury that's holding them back. And um, I think hopefully we had um, taught a few things that could be implemented at home. You know, look, last thing that I wanna say is my heart goes out to you. Pain sucks. Pain aims to steal your life. And Mark and I get that. We really do. Um, and there might be a part of you that wants to fight back because 
you're in self-preservation mode that says, yeah, but you guys aren't in the same kind of pain that I'm in and, and I'm in chronic pain and I've been in chronic pain for four years and you don't even understand what's actually going on. Why did, you know, you gotta like, I, I need to find something that's gonna make this better. Uh, we're with you. That's why Mark is doing this because we don't want you to suffer. We care, we genuinely do. And because we're not in, like I'm, I've been in pain the entire time that we're on the phone or on this call, okay? Um, but the simple fact that we're not in pain the whole time allows our mind to function slightly differently and allows us to say, hey, this is the way your mind can function. Let's find ways for you to get it back. Let's find ways for you to get that flow back, for you to get that strength back, for you to get that flexibility in your mind back, for you to get choice and options back in your brain instead of being stuck in the pain. Let's find ways for you and with you, okay? Because there's no reason you should suffer always. That's just crazy, right? But if there's a way that we can get even a little bit of relief for you, wow, let's start there. You know, let's start there and see what we can do from there, okay? But hang in there. You may not be in pain for the rest of your life. You know, there may be a cure right around the corner. There may be an option. So stay hopeful. Stay hopeful. Absolutely. If you're in the stock market and you can get 9 to 10% growth over the years, that'll compound over time. So sometimes it's not possible to be pain-free right away. That's 100% improvement. Yeah. But what if you're a 10%? this week yeah. and then the next week another 10 percent yeah then what happens a year from now yeah. i'll tell you what man when i've been in terrible pain um and even like even periodically today even periodically yesterday when i've been in, in terrible pain give me three percent you know what i mean like ten percent that'd be amazing give me three percent and i'll feel like i can breathe just like let, let me just shift slightly i can't move my legs anymore somebody has to move them i mean i can move them barely but in my wheelchair, they sit stagnant, static all day. They don't get the, no subtle movement. You know, they're basically the way they are for sometimes 20 hours in a day before I jump down if I'm working a long day. And so, you know, I'm, I'm sort of stuck in that position. So I get it. It sucks. But be patient. There's hope coming. Okay? Mark and I will do what we can to support you. Appreciate your time, PJ. Take care, brother. Thanks. My pleasure. Really good to see you. Bye, beautiful people. Bye. 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 Bye.